Hey everybody! Um, as you can see, this is a little bit different than normal. I'm starting off the podcast a little bit differently this week. Um, this is The Fat Squirrel Speaks. I am Amy Beth, also known as The Fat Squirrel on Ravelry and The Fat SQRRL on Instagram. This is a podcast about knitting. Um, but today we're going to start outside. <clears throat> I haven't podcasted for a few weeks and sometimes it's really hard to get that momentum back. Um, especially when I feel like we are working on a lot of shadow work in our country right now. There are a lot of, I mean, there's not that there are not always hard things going on, but this seems to be an especially rough period. Um, we're working through shadow stuff as a larger society. We're working through shadow stuff on Ravelry. Um, and so it just can feel hard to get the momentum to be joyful and spontaneous um, at these times. Now, that doesn't mean that, I mean, certainly even in the greatest grief, we can have laughter and in great sorrow, we can find beauty and joy and all that good stuff. But sometimes, um, I think since you only see me once, like an hour every few weeks, that I don't want to misrepresent myself as not feeling the weight of the things around us. And so I know that you know that um, the face that we present to the public in terms of social media and things like this is obviously only a very tiny portion of our lives. Like you do not see me yelling at the people in my house for not crushing their soda cans or the recycling bin. You don't see me um, struggling with Gus lunging at the door when the mailman comes. Like you just, (laughs) you don't see all that stuff. And that's really okay. I'm completely okay with that. Like I don't feel like it's disingenuous to not present that to you. Um, But sometimes when there is a lot of darkness around, I feel like only being sunny and positive for the hour might misrepresent myself as being that way all the time. Um, And so I just, I just wanna say that's not the case. And so if you're feeling the heaviness and you're feeling the darkness, I feel it with you. So um, I did a thing where I talked a lot about something that I don't know a lot about. Um, And so I realized in editing that part of the video out um, that I was not clear. And so let me just put this in to clarify um, quickly. As a business owner, as um, I want you to know that I do support Ravelry's decision. And so I want it to be, I'm not looking to debate that. I am silly and fun, but I'm also a very intelligent person, and I enjoy t- I enjoy thinking about things um, from lots of different perspectives and lots of different angles. Um, you can ask my husband. I am always one to play devil's advocate, but this is certainly a situation in which the devil has enough advocates. I'm fine. Um, so I, I say that because I want to be very clear and upfront. If you are a person who purchases from me. I want you to know that I agree with their decision so that if you don't agree with their decision, you don't spend money with me and then regret that later. Um, So just, I just want to be clear. So let's get back and talk about cucumbers. Okay, so now we're handheld. So I apologize. We are going to be a little shaky. I don't have a gimbal. I'm not a magic human being. Um, But (laughs) then let me offer all of the kind of like Yes, I know. Um, Yes, I know there are lots of traffic sounds. I do apologize. I came out the other day in the rain to do an Instagram video of the garden and it was so peaceful and the birds were so lovely and you could not hear the traffic at all. I guess the rain just magically deadened all the noise. But I came out yesterday and it was this loud, perhaps even louder. There were quite a few sirens. Um, And so I thought, no, I'll just wait till tomorrow early and we'll try it again. Yeah, well, it's still loud, so. I guess it's just something we'll have to deal with. Um, so yeah, this is my garden. Ah, right? Before I get started, let me just let you know that I know we're not doing everything the best way possible. Um, <laughs> period, I guess. I guess that's the end of sentence. Um, I know that our yard is definitely um, humble. <laughs> And our garden is too, but I also just want to show you like sometimes you can do things and not do them perfectly, but still do them. And so that's what this is about, I guess, more than anything. This is not a 
um, advice garden segment. This is not an expert garden segment. This is a, we're really super new to this and, but we're still proud of it kind of segment. I know that not everything is done the right way. Trust me, I probably know the right way because I do love to research the pants off of stuff. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes with that, you can get a little bit of paralysis because it's hard to do something knowing you're not doing it exactly the right way. So I guess that's just my caveat. Before you give me advice, I appreciate your sentiment, but it's probably not helpful. Um, if you're like, there's a better way to do that. I probably already know, but just couldn't do it because of our resources and my willingness to commit those resources this year. So you'll definitely see some like sketchy, there's a tarp over some firewood. There's a big pile of brush still from the tree that we had cut down. This is our very fancy bench made of like a <laughs> garbage door uh, that is falling apart. And not in like a shabby chic kind of way, just in a like full on busted kind of way. So I'm being vulnerable and letting you see my imperfection. So please be gentle. I acknowledge that it's highly imperfect. Um, but hey, I'm still really proud of it. These are our cucumbers. And these we started from seed. We started the cucumbers and the tomatoes from seed this year. And I'm really proud of how they've turned out. Um, I tried starting plants from seeds a few years ago and they were a total failure. So the fact that we got good um, seedlings to put out is really exciting to me. Uh, we didn't do it perfectly. We did it in some peat pots, which lots of folks do not recommend because peat is inherently um, environmentally not sustainable. Um, and lots of folks don't think that those little tiny peat pellets let your um, plants get enough root structure before you put them out. Um, there's lots of different reasons not to use those, but we had some, so we used them. Um, I won't necessarily purchase them again. I think I'm going to go the toilet paper roll route next time where you start your seedlings with toilet paper rolls. Um, but that all said, our imperfect method gave us plants that are, sorry, Annie and Gus are fussling. Um, our imperfect uh, starting gave us these awesome plants. Check it out. And like I was really worried that we weren't getting fruit um, because I don't see a lot of pollinators out here. Now I have since seen some bees and some weird things that I'm not really sure what those are. But we totally are. Look at this you guys. So here's all of our the cucumbers are in. Oh I didn't say this too. Um, we've had four of these kind of like plastic resin um, raised beds for like seven years, eight years maybe, maybe seven years. So this year we got four more. So we basically doubled our garden space. Originally we had them right here in this like nice new weed patch we've got going. It's not always a weed patch, but we haven't mowed it at least recently. <laughs> My husband only mows it like every third time or something. I'm not sure what schedule he's working on, but whatever. Um, so they used to be up against this fence, but it would be really hard to weed the back of the beds. Um, and I originally put them there just to kind of keep them out of the way as much as possible. But now that we're a little bit more committed, I felt emboldened to move them away from the fence. So this removed four beds, added four more. So we doubled our space. This little four by four, I don't think they're quite four by four. I think they're almost four by four. This little four by four has like 20 ish cucumber plants. I can't remember off the top of my head, but look guys, look. Can you see the giant cucumber? I'm so excited. And like, look at all the babies. There's so many. So at first I really thought, oh gosh, our, our nothing is setting. Like our fruits aren't setting. We must not be getting pollinators. And I thought, oh, I'm gonna have to, look, there's another one. Oh, sorry. There's I'm going to have to like hand pollinate everything and that's doable, but kind of a chore. But look, we don't. Um, apparently on cucumbers, the male flowers set on first and then the female flowers set. So I think we were just having confusion. We had way more male flowers and so I wasn't seeing any fruit and was confused. Um, but yeah, there they are. They're on this like, just like little cheapo um, net trellising. And the trellising is just supported, oops, it's just supported right now by um, T-posts, which are things you can get at like your tractor supply or your 
um, local home improvement store. Um, they're fairly affordable. I think these are like $4 a piece. I could be wrong. They're not quite $4, I don't think. Um, and then the vegetable netting, is. this is a total of, there's one really long one and one shorter one. Um, so I think this is like 19, that's too much. But it's less than $20 worth of netting. <laughs> and then these are our tomato plants, which I also started from seed. Three of them were not from seed. Three of them we bought from the farmer's market because I only did paste tomatoes this year. Um, so I did get three plants for like slicers. Um, but yeah, so here they are. Now this is another place I know we're not doing everything correctly. I should be probably pruning these plants to get more fruit to set, but I just haven't. I just haven't. <laughs> we do have some little guys on here, if I can find them. It's kind of disorienting to try to look through the camera and the lighting is kind of weird outside, but um, we do have some tomatoes starting. We don't have anything that's easy to see, obviously. Um, but yeah, so yes, yeah, so we should probably tr have, um, because when the plant puts out all of its energy in foliage, it doesn't put as much energy into fruiting. And so as you can see, these guys are very tomato jungly. So we could probably do to um, prune to get more fruit, but whatever, it's fine. So we have two four by fours of tomato plants. And oh yeah, so these are also just tomato cages we've had. I know tomato cages are not um, perfect. <laughs> we've got, I've had these for several years. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use them now until we figure out a better system for us. Um, but so yeah, between the like retaining fence to keep the cats in the neighborhood from, and quite frankly, Gus, because he's horrible. He's digging right now um, from digging up the garden. Between that and some stakes occasionally for support, they seem to be very supported in there because they're all, well, right up next to each other. So <laughs> we planted them per square foot gardening. So yeah, you can see there's definitely no room for weeds. No room for weeds. Here's the other side of the cucumber beds. And then we're moving into beans. So these are half runner, these are white half runner beans, which are always the beans that my grandparents planted. Um, so we did a bunch of those. A few of them are greasy grit beans, um, but most of them are white half runners. But you can see they're also sharing the cucumber trellising. No flowers on yet on those. Those of course we did not start from seed, those were direct so. And some of them got a later start than others. I would like to pretend that was because I was staggering for crop, but Quite frankly, it was just because those didn't really do well. I think we planted them when it was a little too wet. Um, and then we move into Three Sisters. I'm gonna sit down for Three Sisters. Maybe I should zoom out for Three Sisters. So here is our Three Sisters. You can see, of course, there's corn. And we just did sweet corn this year. Um, I've never planted corn before because it's such a space hog that we've, you know, we've always had pretty minimal garden space. Um, but this year, since we, we increased our space so much, I felt like, okay, we can try to do it this year. Sorry for the truck. Um, so you can see we have sweet corn and we did stagger these. So the center four plants got planted earlier than the outside plants. You can see they're smaller. Um, hi, Gus. Oh yes, you have so much dirt on your face, okay. Yes, please feel free to wipe it off on me. That's great. Um, but you can probably see in there that there are more um, runner beans. And you plant those, you let the corn come up about, at least it's about six inches is usually what I see. And then you plant um, a runner bean around it. So again, some of these are greasy grits and some of them are white half runners. We'll be able to tell when they harvest because they have a different pod like a different bean inside the pod so it'd be very easy to tell which one is which um so you then plant those around the corn and then after those are established you plant some winter squash and so the theory is that the beans fix nitrogen into the soil so they're good for the other plants and they also help to support the corn which is surprisingly like 
wobbly for quite some time. Now that these ears are getting more um, established, they seem to be doing better, but you'll see that like, I have some random branches in here, which I had just put in to just give a little bit more support for their leans. So the corn was just kind of leaning. And so the beans then um, not only fix that nitrogen, but they also add stability to the corn because they use the corn as a way, as a place to run. Um, to vine around so it gives the corn a little bit more stability and then after you get those established then you come in and plant your winter squash so in this bed there are six corn plants 12 runner beans and four winter squash and that is pretty accurate i may have gone i think i was really only supposed to put four corn plants in but i just couldn't do it it looks so naked. Now it looks very lush, but I may have pushed it a little bit. Um, but so our squash that we have in these are a Baby Blue Hubbard, North Georgia Candy Roasters, Hopi Pale Grays, and I don't know how to say it, but I think it's Kaboka, which is a Japanese butternut squash, which is really yummy. Um, so yeah. So yeah. There is our garden in, so we did three of the three sisters. So three of our four by fours are in three sisters. And there is Gus. He just got a haircut, so he's super naked. But it's summer and it's hot and he seems pretty okay with it. <laughs> and he likes to survey to make sure there aren't any squirrels or birds that will potentially murder us. So yeah, there it is. All right, let's go talk about some knitting. So I'll put myself at a wider angle so that you know I am not talking to you naked. Not that I couldn't. And I am feeling a little bit vulnerable and a little bit exposed. <laughs> but I did want you to know <laughs> that I was uh, not secretly completely exposed. Um, so I'm going to zoom back in just so we have like better proportions and whatnot, but I'm not naked. Um, <laughs> hey, I just want to put this in here. I know that I just said that I was wearing clothes in this podcast, but in editing it, I had no idea how it really did seem like I was completely naked the whole time. So I'm just going to put this in here and acknowledge that normally I would go ahead and re-record this podcast, but I literally don't have time at this moment. So <laughs> I'm sorry-ish. A little bit it is kind of weird and I acknowledge that so let's talk about knitting um actually I lied let's talk about some other stuff um I have my coffee um I will be attending the super summer knit together which is in Nashville Tennessee it's hosted by the knit girls um so I will be there and I'm very much looking forward to it later here in July um, and I will be vending at that market, so I'll have lots of bags there. If you are, um, a for, uh, if you've gone to SSK in the past, you know that I usually do a tagged bag, and I will do one this year, but I am surprisingly quite behind. Um, <laughs> um, we've had some, um, well, it's been a hard summer so far. We've had some, my grandmother passed away at the end of May, and My grandfather has been experiencing increased dementia, and if you've watched the show for a while, you know that um, they're really important people in my life. So, it's been important to spend time with Tova. She started summer break. And so I'm, yes, I'm still working, still doing lots of stuff. My time schedule is just a little bit off and, um, I'm just going to do what I can do. And Gus is going to do it with me, even though he has a pretty gnarly haircut. Not that the haircut didn't do, I mean, the groomer did a great job. We asked her to cut him really short, um, because in the summertime he likes to dig a lot. Well, this is the first summer with him. But he loves to dig and he loves to um, hunt the dog that's in the water bowl. So 
he when he gets real bushy in his face which is when he's the super cutest he also gets so much stuff in his face so <laughs> so he's super naked right now so um so I'm a little bit behind that was a lot of me almost crying to say that I'm a little bit behind and I'm okay with it don't worry I'm not beating myself up I'm not um, worried about disappointing people like I can I am totally okay well I mean I'm not totally okay with my behind this of course I just have a tendency to beat myself about, up about anything but in a logical way I am really okay with um, where I'm at so um, but oh, okay so that was all to say that usually I do pre-orders for that tag bag a bit earlier um, but this year it'll be later um, so I'm assuming, I'm thinking it'll be July 5th is when I'll open that. Hey, 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 hey. The dogs are turning crazy. Give it, give it, give it. We're fighting over things. Their favorite thing is to fight over something that nobody actually wants. Do your dog see that? Like it's a thing that neither of them actually want, but Gus needs to hide it from Annie because it's his. But then Annie finds it, and then she needs, and there's just like a whole hole blue, and neither one of them even want it. Get that? No, let's not get into it. <laughs> a loss of roundaboutness to say that I expect to have the um, SSK pre orders up July 5th, and I'll keep them up for probably almost until I leave. Um, probably, at le definitely for a week. But maybe even, you know, up until like two weeks until the 14th. No, no, that would be actually the time that we're going. <laughs> we're close to it, sorry. Um, so July 5th, I'll leave them up for at least a week, but maybe even longer. Um, just because I know that I'm not giving you lots of notice. Um, so yeah, that's happening. And then I will have a regular update the last Friday of July. And it'll be a pretty meaty update. Um, so yay. And then, I'm not kidding you, shortly thereafter, I got some fat bathing beauties fabric, which will be sewing um, some fat ladies in bikinis uh, for your project bag. So that'll be happening shortly. That'll be probably in later in July. No, that will be in August because July will be over. Oh my God. Now Gus is like compulsively sniffing everything because he needs to find the thing that I took from him. Let's talk about some knitting. Um, I did do some spinning. I'm so excited. Amber, who is yarn hoarder, um, has posted. Oh, sorry, I just got distracted. We have so many. <laughs> that's what this podcast is. Uh, we have so many adolescent birds right now, and it's really <laughs> hilarious to watch them with their um, their caretaking parent. Because so many of the adolescent sparrows just never shut their mouths. Like they literally just leave their mouth open constantly for the, for the parent to come and feed them. Like they just <laughs> never, that's how you can tell this adolescent because it does have its mouth shut. It's crazy. Now the house finches, we also have a lot of adolescent house finches there. They don't do that. And the adolescent house doves do not do that. But man, those adolescent house bears are just constantly with their mouths open. Gus, get down. It still looks like I'm naked. I'm still not naked. Or am I? Um, but I did some spinning because Amber, who is Yarn Hoarder, of course, of the Yarn Hoarder podcast, had been posting this in insanely gorgeous, insanely gorgeous um, crocheted hexagons, I think, uh, blanket that she's been working on. It is crazy gorgeous. And also just there's been so much good spinning lately. Everybody's doing it. I want to do it too. Um, so I have these bats. Well, they're like mini bats that I purchased from Knit Spin Farm at our Hoosier Hill Fibers, Hoosier Hills Fiber Festival. So, of course, there's her info. She's fabulous. These have Angelina BFL Merino Polar Shetland Silk Noil Tarhi Ramboulet. And this colorway is little by little. There's like three and a quarter ounces. So here is my bobbin. So I'm just doing it. I'm doing it on my largest pulley. Um, so that means that the bobbin is spinning slower like so I'll, I'll pedal fast but this bobbin will still spin slower so it helps you to put less twist in your yarn which helps you get a fatter yarn um it's one of the ways you can do that there are multiples that's the way I do it um so here it is it's definitely a thicker spin and it'll be a two ply so my plan is to spin all of these little bats onto one bobbin 
And then I have some Tarky that I purchased from, I feel like it's Tarky Hillbilly, is that right? Now I'm not sure, I'm doubting myself. Sorry, my nose is so itchy. I feel like it's Tar Heel Billy Farm. But am I? Tar Heel Billy Farmer. That's totally right. Um, they have an Instagram account. Again, it's like this. And they are folks in, I think, southeastern Ohio who have a farm. So yay, I found them through... Um, hey, Brownberry, who also has a podcast and is an awesome knitwear designer. Um, and they, yeah, I was especially excited because they're in Ohio and like, hi, I love turkey. So that's very exciting. Um, yeah. So that's my plan is to do one strand of Knit Spin Farm and one strand of that. Uh, and it's just a, a natural colored turkey. It's like a, it's white, but it's not white, white. It's like a soft, creamy white. So yeah, there's that. Okay, so then, finished objects. I finished my Quaker yarn stretcher. So this is fiber that I spun from, spun right round. She doesn't do, I don't know that she does not do fiber anymore, but I don't, I've not seen her fiber for quite some time. So I think she's mostly concentrating on yarn and her yarns are gorgeous. And she's also super cute. She probably, she's super cool. So here's this. This is my second Quaker yarn stretcher, I think. And I just really dig this pattern. It is, she, I believe that she actually may have reformatted um, the way she um, wrote the main body of the yarn because I, pattern, because I really remember for some reason on the first one I did, struggling to remember like which like where which which rows I put the increases on and the, I don't know I just remember like struggling with that for some reason but first this time when I looked at the pattern it made perfect sense and I knew exactly which rows I was increasing on and not increasing on and only increasing on one side versus increasing on both sides. I it made complete sense this time so I don't know I don't know <laughs> that is all to say is the first time I knit it, it was harder for me to knit as like a, t uh, not as a TV, that was totally fine as a TV project, but like as a social project. And this time it would be fine for a social project. So I would even recommend it as, if you're not a sock knitter, as a talky talk knitting pattern. <laughs> so the pattern is actually written for hand spun and it's written so that you can use up all of your hand spun. And it's written for a four ounce DK skein. But I did a double because I'm a big person and a tiny one skein shawl, there's, this end is woven in, it's just not trimmed. And a tiny one skein shawl often makes me feel like a giantess sitting on a child's potty chair. No, it just looks like I'm wearing wool and nothing else. Mm. Like that. So anyway, I like that I can wear it like a scarf, essentially. Like that is how I tend to wear this um, really like long and narrowish, um, is it, it's a boomerang? I think it's boomerang, um, style shawl. And I like it because I don't like to knit scarves. I don't like to knit this many stitches on a row. And this is, since it's, it's knit more of like an bias style, you have pretty healthy rows. Like you can see that orange color, that's a row. So you don't have little tiny flip flap, flip flap, flip flap rows. So that's why I like this rather than, even though I wear it like a regular scarf, I prefer it. Also, it's a little bit zazui, I think. So then I've also been, speaking of knit spin, oh no, I need to bring that over too. Okay, one second, I'll be right back with you. Okay, I did bring it, it was just under my butt. Not really, but kind of. So. The next thing I want to show you is I was sent this yarn from Mad Fuzzy, raised, milled, and hand dyed in Maine. And this is a local base. It is 100% East Frisian wool. 
and this is the countryside colorway. So it's a sock yarn, it's a two ply, and it does not have nylon and it is not superwash. I mean, you can use it for whatever. But isn't it pretty? Ooh, look at that. Look at that. Oh my gosh, the lichen, the moss, the silvery maple trees. Mm, right there. So. Here is my sock so far. I know it doesn't look like much, but I'm a really slow sock knitter, y'all. I don't know why I'm saying it doesn't look like much. Look at that. It's gorgeous. I could be on the moors in these socks, y'all. The moors. Um, so I did, this is a, a finer, well, it's not really fine. It's like a, it's like, I would say it's a light fingering. Um, and it does have more inconsistencies in its, um, yarn circumference <laughs> the thickness of the yarn <laughs> which I would expect um, from a locally sourced yarn so one of the reasons I went down a needle size is not just that but because also it's not super wash I wanted my knitting to be firm enough that I felt like it would um, increase its durability so I went down a needle size. So these are double zero double points. Um, these are carbons. I do like their sock needles the best of all the needles I've used. Um, and I went up eight stitches. So normally I do a 72 stitch sock, but because I was going down a needle size, I went up an eight stitch in circumference. That's usually what I do. For a sport weight yarn, I usually go up a needle size. I'm sorry if I said that the other way, but... I go up a needle size for sport weight and down a circumference size. So if I normally knit a 72 stitch fingering weight sock on zeros, I will knit a 64 stitch sport weight sock on size ones. And then, ooh, something is itching me. That's the only, worst, that's the only bad thing about dresses like this. Well, for me, it's the other thing bad. <laughs> is that I'm constantly like have a stray hair or something that I cannot, it's like, ooh. I don't normally feel like that when I'm wearing a tank top. Um, so that will increase the durability. And I also wanted them to be um, a little bit looser because they're not super washed. I want to give them a little bit more room. Um, I will hand wash them, but you know, with repeated hand washings and slightly vigorous hand washing because it is a sock. Um, and I am barefoot like all the time because I am a heel billy, um, a tar heel billy then <laughs> I want them to give them a little room for a little bit of felting. Now, usually felting does not affect circumference as much as it does length, but it's just something to be aware of when using a non superwash sock yarn. And I've not done that a lot lately, or lately. I've not done that a lot at all. <laughs> so I want to just give myself a little extra room. Now, I did have a crisis of faith when I got to about the heel flap. I thought, I don't want these to be socks. I want them to be slippers, this yarn. I want this to be held double. It'll be super cozy and just like also warm to wear like as an over sock. And so I cast on for a pair of slippers. I broke, I didn't unrip, I didn't rip my sock out because I knew that I am me and I might change my mind. <laughs> so I did not rip it out. I just took it off the needles, started over, held my yarn double. And then I got hmm, maybe two inches into my slipper and realized I liked the sock better. So I ripped out the, the slipper, which again, it's a total pain in the arse to rip out yarn held double, but whatever, was fine. And so now we're just focusing on the sock. <laughs> so, ooh. So then I have another sock that I've also been working on. And this is also yarn from Knit Spin Farm. That's not her card. I don't know. Did I not put it in there? I'm kind of the worst, if you haven't noticed. This is one of her. She did um, a series. Of this. I don't know if this is the only one she did, but she did this colorway, and she did it in variable stripes. So you can see that they're all different lengths. And there's, I think, no rhyme to re no reason to the, the... Like, I don't think it's like... I don't think if you split the skin in half, you'd get the same pair of socks, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Or you would have fraternal, not identical twins. 
So um, this is her Tar He fingering weight yarn. And I, I love Tar He. It's like the best. Now this is a Tar He nylon, um, but it is so plump and so, it's just the right amount of toothy. It's toothier than Merino, but not as toothy as the Coriadale. I do like the Coriadale sock yarn, but this I find to be easier to knit when it's humid than the Coriadale, which I have a trouble tensioning correctly when it's humid. My tension seems to get super tight on the Coriadale. Uh, but the Tarki is still smooth enough that I don't get that, but it still has that toothiness that just is, can you tell? It's just like a sensory pleasure. It's just like you can feel when you're knitting the stitches locking together. Um, and it just, it's very pleasurable. So I'm just doing a four by two rib. Um, I think I started to do um, SKYP. Yeah, I did. No, I didn't. I did, but I took it out. I started to use the SKYP, but you just couldn't see it. So I just decided to do a four by two rib, which I like quite a lot. Um, in terms of like, it's that wonderful flexiness of the rib, but again, not quite as much purling. I'm anti-purling. So I have one sock. I will put an afterthought heel in it. They're not super long. And then I've got the other toe and a little bit started on the second sock. So yay. Okay, and then lastly, but not leastly, I cast on a Magpie Tendency. So this pattern was released several weeks ago. It's Mag by Tendency by Skateagains, whose name, whose, whose um, synthetic name is Melissa Alexander Loomis. So this is the picture for it. And then you may have also seen, so that's the solid version. There's also um, a two color version where you do like a, th a slightly longer, like three quarter sleeve. And then there is a short sleeve version using a sock mini and a skein or more depending on your size. So I decided that I wanted to do this version. Let me talk to you more about the pattern. It's available in a pretty good size range. Let's see. Sizes, um, finish sizes 35 to 72.5 inches. That's 90 to 185 centimeters. Um, and you want to choose a size that is 6 to 12 inches or 15 to 30 centimeters larger than your full bust measurement. Um, so that means if you're doing 6 inches of positive ease, you can be <laughs> 66. So it's sized up to a bust measurement, like a person, like a human bust measurement of 66.5 to get that ease. So great range of sizes. And then um, it is also cropped. And for lots of the sizes, you only need... Um, like a skein and a contrast skein. So that's awesome. So for my size, I mostly need a skein and a contrast skein. And I have done that. I have, whoo, that looks so vivid. I'm going to see what'll happen when it goes on to the, um, the editing. <laughs> I had this Quinson Company um, fingering weight. I can't think of what the base is called. This is the apricot colorway. Finch, right? And then I was given this hand spun. The fiber is from Heartland. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> I thought she'd reused the tag. Um, Heartland hand spun, and she gave me this. It's 100% Falkland in the Buddha's Breath colorway, and it's 405 yards, and it's about a sport weight. So again, let me give you her information. I'm trying to see what her. Heartland hand spun. It was given to me by her. And so it's sport, so I knew that it was a little bit um, fluffier than the, um, the the quince, but I was okay with that because it was going to be in the body, and really it just, I think it turned out really well. Now, it's not done, but I am done with the body of it. I just need to do sleeves. it over my boobs that are not in a bra. I'm not going to show it to you because I'm not wearing a bra. And it's also not finished. But I just wanted to show you how the neck looked. Right? That's totally what it was. <laughs> I'll show it to you for real when I get it done. But I do, I do really like the little, like I like this little, like sort of military-ish. <laughs> I think I'm going to put my stars there. Um, and I like the, I was concerned that it would be too um, 
the pattern is written so that the back and the front, I believe, yeah, I don't think the back has short rows. I did one set of short rows, like one, um, four rows of short rows in the back neck, just because like I do, I, I can sometimes feel like this boat neck thing is like this and it makes, it makes it not wearable to me. So I added a little bit of short row, but I don't think you need to at all because it's open enough that I don't think you would feel that. But I was paranoid, so I over engineered. So I'm gonna do the sleeve out of the orange and we'll see, I don't have a ton, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> I don't have a ton of the quince left. So I'll just knit the sleeves as long as I can. Another thing that I did was a little bit different is that I noticed from lots of FO picks that the line between the contrast and the main color in this configuration hit, it seemed like it hit right at the, at the fullest bust measurement. And that makes me, I, I don't like the way that looks on me. Like it makes me feel a little bit like, yeah. <laughs> Normally I'm really okay with, yeah, these are my boobs. But for some reason I was as hesitant. So I did not do, in the pattern you're waiting until you get to the arm to you combine, combine for the body to switch to your contrast, but I did mine up here or your main color, however you want to call it, your other color. I did mine a little bit higher than that. Um, and that was again, just because I didn't want that line right there, but it looks super cute on other folks, it was just me. Sorry, I got a little froggy there. I also forgot to zoom back in because you can see so much of my wood paneling. I just spit. Did you notice? Okay, let's go back together. But anyway, I'll tell you more about it um, next time when I show you the finished object. Hopefully. I imagine it'll be done next time. But I'm pretty jazzed about it. I will not lie to you. I was kind of... I, when I first came out, I was super like, oh my gosh, that's so cute. And then I thought... Do I only think it's cute? Not that I only think it's cute, but do I think it's cute because cute people are wearing it and they're using cute yarn. I'm a cute person and I had cute yarn. Why did that make me think that it wasn't gonna work for me? <laughs> but you know, sometimes you use a yarn just because like, you're like, oh, this is such a good fit for the yarn, but I'm not sure this is really something I need or want. Do you know, have you done that? Like, have you knit a shawl because you're like, oh my gosh, these two, like, these yarns were not planned to go together. Like I just happened to have the quince in stash and then this hand spun was gifted to me and I was like, um, hello, they must be used together. So am I only knitting this because I feel like these yarns need to be married and I am their pastor and I need to make it happen for them? Or is it because I actually want this project? <laughs> but I think I'm now on the side of like, oh no, I think I actually do want this project too. I'm not just a matchmaker. I'm gonna be friends with them when they're a married couple. Oh, and I forgot to mention this, this dress that I'm wearing, but not wearing. Remember, I am wearing a dress. I totally made this dress this last time, or since I talked to you last. So I'll put a bit of finished object here. Okay, so I know that's not the greatest finished object because you can't see the top of the dress. And that's because it is a sleeveless dress and I have to wear a bra with it if I'm wearing it in the actual world but I didn't actually make it to wear in the actual world. Um, I have an old navy dress that is a million years old. Okay, it's eight years old <laughs> and it's like this. It's this elastic-y um, like faux smocking. You do smocking but just with elastic thread. Guess what, now I actually am naked. <laughs> But I needed to just show you, and it was too hard to show you, like, while it was on my body. Bonus! <laughs> so it's this, like, faux smocking, and you use an elastic bobbin. Do you see me? I'm, like, so, like, oh my gosh, I am naked. You use... <laughs> you use an elastic bobbin thread, <clears throat> which you have to hand wind. It's actually not that bad. Um, and then just a regular top stitch thread. And you just do an elong elongated, bi like a bias. That's not the right word. 
basting. You do it like a basting stitch, you elongate your stitches, and then it creates this smocking. So there is a piece of quarter inch elastic in the very top, but the rest of it is just elastic thread. And this, remember when I was in the garden, I was like, thanks Gus for wiping your face on me. So this fabric was really great to do it on because these dots are spaced just a little bit, they're like three eighths of an inch apart. And you want to do your, your faux smocking from between a quarter and a half inch apart. So I just followed the dotted lines and made it super mega easy. Okay, I have my clothes on again. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I had this dress from Old Navy from a long time ago and it had this, a lot, this smocking stitch in it. And I loved it. I loved it for camping because I could wear it either like as um, a, like a cover up at the pool or I could wear it like from the shower house back to the camp and then just wear it. So it wasn't like I was trying to like put on my clothes in the steamy shower house because like there's a lot of me in a very small cubey thing to, oh, it's hot. So <laughs> I really like that I could just, I could actually put it on on the way to the shower because it's not really touching my dirty body very much and then shower and then put it right back on and I felt like it wasn't binding or gross. I don't wear a bra with it even at the campground you're camping y'all all bets are off all bets are off so I could like take my shower come back to the campfire sit around head to bed and not have to be like changing into seven different things so I really loved it for that and I also just really like it for wearing around the house like on the weekend um I did mean to put a pocket in this one and I totally forgot so I'm hoping that I will go back and maybe either put an actual like inseam pocket in it or just put a patch bucket on it. I don't even care. Just so I have a place to put my phone, like, so I don't leave my phone, because I do have a tendency to do that when I'm around the house and I can't find it, and I have to ask Alexa to find my phone for me. It's a pain. But anyway, so this is like a super simple product or pattern <clears throat> sewing project. And I never did this before because that elastic thread is super expensive. Like if you buy a spool of it, like it's Guterman, I think, it's like 10 yards, it's like $4. Who can do that? I'm huge. I need, I think there's like 18 rows of smocking on here and I am 56 inches around with the fullest part of my bus. So like that's a lot of yardage of elastic thread. Don't make me do the math right now. It's not cool. But I knew it was gonna be a lot more than I wanted to spend on this kind of project. So I really was like, ugh. And then I realized I could buy it from Amazon I know, issues. You can buy an entire like giant spool of it for $8 and I did not even make a dent in it for this dress. Like I could probably make 20 more dresses out of that. So then it became a reality and now I feel like I wanna make everything this dress. So the math on this is basically that you need one and a half to two times your circumference. Now I was like, does that mean my biggest circumference? Like, does that mean my hip measurement or my bust measurement? I decided that it meant um, my full bust because I was like, well, then it will be too loose on my upper bust. It's not. Um, so I did one and a half times my full bust, which is somewhere between one and a half to two times my upper bust. So it worked out fine with me and that's the measurement I went with. Now, most fabric is anywhere from 42 to 56 inches, sometimes 60 inches in width. So you have two options. You can either use two lengths of fabric, depending on your circumference. You can either use two lengths of fabric, or if your circumference is bigger than, what would that be? If you did, if the fabric was 42 inches, that's 84 inches. So if you're bigger than 50-ish, 52-ish, something like that, inches. If, you're, if your measurement is bigger than that, then you can go the opposite way. And instead of using two lengths of fabric, you can just use the width of the fabric for your length and get the yardage you need for the circumference. So let's say that you're 60 inches around, then you wanna get 90 inches of fabric and your length will just be, depending on the fabric you get, whatever the width of the fabric is. This fabric was 52, something, 52 inches, I think, and I had 
like a huge margin left um, and the hem that I took out. So, and I'm pre-washed and everything. So, and it's a long dress. It's almost ankle length. Um, so, I don't know, it's just a great option. Just saying. You can put um, straps on if you feel like you're feel insecure, like it's falling, or if you just want to do a podcast and maybe not have people think you're doing it topless. Then you, <laughs> my old navy dress actually has buttons right here. Like it has just a little tiny half inch -ish, quarter inch maybe even button. It has one here, one here, and then on the back. And they just use strips of the fabric and with a button hole in it so that you could attach the straps if you wanted to, or you just leave them off. Um, so if I decide that I want to be able to wear this with a regular bra out in the universe, then I could totally just put some straps on it that way. Or you can sew them in, whatever you want. It's up to you. Okay. Okay. So I think that's all now. <laughs> and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.